Hello and good afternoon. Uh, welcome to another session of In Dialogue Foundation Certificate Course in Dialogue Studies 2022-23. Today we have Dr. Soumya Brata Chaudhary to deliver a talk titled Dialogue is Not Simply Communication, Common Language and Uncommon Effects. Dr. Chaudhary is Associate Professor at the School of Arts and Aesthetics, Jawaharlal Nehru University. He has authored uh, the book, Theater, Number, Event, Three Studies on the Relationship Between Sovereignty, Power, and Truth, and articles on ancient Greek liturgy, the staging of Ibsen, psychoanalysis, Nietzsche, Schiller, and Hegel. His book, Ambekar and Other Immortals, an untouchable research program, came out in 2018. His latest book is now uh, is titled, Now It's Come to Distances, Notes on Coronavirus and Shaheen Bagh, Association and Isolation, which was published in 2020. So to the participants, please keep your cameras on and try and make the session as interactive as possible by asking questions and sharing comments. Dr. Chaudhary, you have up to two hours to conduct the session and uh, we will take questions after that. Um, thank you uh, for joining us today, sir. Over to you, you may begin now. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm very, very, very happy to be speaking to you. I thank the organizers for the invitation. Um, like I was, uh, you know, talking about this a moment back. Uh, unfortunately, I was not able to really uh, go through the YouTube material of, you know, of, of this platform. But when I, when I took a look at the modules and the themes of uh, this uh, course on, on, on dialogue, um, then there were certain areas where I thought I could try and, you know, say a few things which might be of some use. Uh, so let's see how that works out. Um, so uh, that's what I'll try to do. Uh, at, at a relatively general level, we'll have some specific uh, contexts and illustrations and discussions, of course, which I hope uh, you'll also, um, you know, maybe have your own things to say during the question answer session. I'll speak for maybe uh, around um, an hour, a little more than an hour, but not too much more than an hour. Uh, so that you have at least 45, 50 minutes to ask your questions, because uh, we want to eventually wind up with Um So, um, I mean, you heard the title. It's a very general title. Um, and I have some, re I mean, I did uh, indicate some readings. I don't know if uh, some of you took a look at them, but I'll also probably refer to those readings uh, in the in, in the course of this uh, talk. Uh, at a very general level, uh, the, th the first thing is this particular word that is such a, well, common word, dialogue, uh, is rooted in uh, two Greek words, uh, the, the two parts of the word dialogue, dia uh, and uh, log, the, the, uh, are both uh, uh, the source, uh, the sources are in the Greek language. Uh, now, uh, the second part, the uh, dialogue, that is, uh, the second part of this word, the second component of this word, is rooted in the Greek word logos, uh, which in, in, in the Greek language uh, normally, commonly translates as simply language. Um, but uh, it's interesting to see that it also uh, sometimes gets translated as uh, uh, discourse. Discourse, uh, which means something more specific. Discourse as something which is a kind of uh, articulation of some sort of a proposition, some set of ideas, not just common language. And, as, and the third translation that is often uh, made in English of the Greek word logos is uh, reason rationality. So all these three seem to be contained in the second part of the word dialogue, uh, logos, uh, which is language in the most general common sense, and uh, discourse in that specific articulated sense, and reason 
in the sense of something almost universal and anthropological as something belonging to the so-called human species. That's the one side. Now the other side, from where the word actually takes off, uh, dia, dia, dialogue. In Greek, the word dia is a very interesting word because it doesn't really mean two in the simple sense of two separate things. Dia means a kind of fork, a kind of crossroad from where you can take this way or that way. So dear is a kind of moment of choice, you know? Uh, so it's not simply two separated entities or objects or people or whatever. Dear is within the space of language or reason or discourse, uh, the choices that you make, the site that you go to, as in the literal physical moment of, you know, you. You can go to one side or another when you are at a crossing. So uh, what I want to, just as an initial remark, want to indicate to you is that um, in dialogue, uh, in this kind of, a, you know, etymological sense, in the original etymological sense, uh, first of all, uh, any kind of um, use of language, use of putting out a position, um, articulating a discourse takes place within a common space and that could be language or it could be reason but it takes place within some sort if you were to draw a kind of Venn diagram then the large, larger circle the larger circle here would be that common space of logos in the Greek language and at the same time within that particular larger space there is, in dialogue, a specific conjuncture, a kind of moment, you know, a threshold, where it cannot be simply common, it cannot be simply, you know, the same for everyone. Within that common space, there are specific conjunctures where it is uh, absolutely imperative to make choices, to take positions. And it's that moment of the crossroad, that stage of the crossroad, that we also then have what could be further called divergence. In that, again, in that literal sense, you know, in mathematics, you have convergence series and divergence series. So a divergence series, as if a line separates into two separate lines. Without in any way sacrificing the initial premise, which is that we are within that common space. That could be language, but it could even be something even more, like I said, general and fundamental, which is our very faculty for being able to think in something like a rational way or within something like uh, rationality. So this is, that, this is somewhere, you know, is at stake in this very simple word dialogue. The reason why I, I make this initial remark is that usually we start off with a simple um, binary scheme, a scheme of separation that there are two entities, two actors or you know participants in a dialogue. And then of course they have a dialogue and in having the dialogue, they have a debate or they come to an agreement or they're not able to come to an agreement and so on and uh, so forth. But Within the schema, the separation of these two participants is so, in our kind of common sense uh, association, uh, it's so obvious and it's so inflexible. It's just there that maybe it, it's interesting to, to uh, slightly um, disturb that sort of a fixity, to uh, make that fixity a little, a little uh, less, uh, less fixed. And in that sense, the Greek word, uh, the Greek words here, dia and logos, do, does, uh, do help us in understanding dialogue as something which is actually within something larger than two, which is a kind of common. So obviously, when we speak of, uh, you know, the common space of language, 
that we are thinking of something which is extremely divergent and polyphonous. I mean, so many voices, so many things, so many words, so many thoughts, everything is included in what we call language. It's all already there in language. At the same time, if that language was not already present to us, that individual utterance, the individual proposition, the individual opinion that we sort of utter in a public discussion or in a so-called dialogue with someone else uh, wouldn't be possible. So in that sense, we could say that language as the space of something like the common or um, something which is shared is, uh, is already a kind of indirect source of communication. It is not direct communication. So, you know, in, in uh, the second uh, common sense uh, notion that we carry, which again needs to be troubled a little bit, I think, is that we are able to completely master our thoughts, whatever the thoughts, those thoughts might be in language, and communicate them and send them across to the other side where our so-called interlocutor, our opponent, a co-participant in the dialogue stands. So in that sense, it's a very clear spatial image that we have. There is, uh, and it's usually used in a kind of linguistics um, modeling that we have a sender who sends across a message, goes across the receiver, and then the receiver in turn sends across the message. And this is how communication eventually takes place. Or, I mean, the failure of communication takes place. But the process, the schema is that. But again, the schema probably is a little simplistic, like most schemas are. Because what we think of as the message, that which is being carried across from the sender to the receiver, is already uh, premised, or it is assumed that the sender of that message is in complete control of what he or she is intending to communicate, as if it is a kind of direct, literally a delivery of a message from one side to the other, of a package. So the very spatial, leap, imagined, visualized uh, notion. The information, there are the sets of information which are packed in a box and you deliver it to the other side. And the receiver opens it up and finds whatever is there in that, and then, you know, sends across his or her own box in turn, and so it goes on. But this, uh, what is missed in the schema or in this sort of uh, visualization, is that there are two things that are missed. I think first, what is missed is that. Uh, no, uh, this kind of uh, uh, this kind of a. Uh, 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 imagination of something which is being simply delivered as communication, uh, the communication of a message or a content. The word content in our social media, age of social media, is so, so common. No, everything is content, uh, which is the same thing as a kind of message. Uh, now, uh, what is being missed here is first that um, this so called piece of content, this so called piece of communication, which is being directly, apparently directly sent across to the receiver, is dependent on something which is a larger pool of already available, already existent structure. And that is the structure we call language as such, any language. That precedes us. So in that sense, even mother tongue is another stuff. Mother tongue is not really a property of my, of my property. Even a mother tongue, which is closest to me, is itself something that I get from somewhere else. You know? So in, uh, I don't want to get into too many technical uh, discussions here, but uh, one particular way of looking at language is through psychoanalysis. And psychoanalysis uh, looks at everything through uh, relationships, as we some of you know, uh, through specific structures of um, father, mother, the, the fundamental nucleus of father, mother, and the child. And the mother is written by a certain psychoanalytic kind of vocabulary as not simply M-O-T-H-E-R, but M and then within bracket, 
O T H E R. So it, mother is already an other. You know? The mother is not simply mother in the sense of a complete fusion with the child or the subject. So everything that comes to us comes as from an other, including something closest to us. Language is probably the most um, the most powerful example of that. Something without which we cannot at all conceive of our own human existence. And at the same time, it comes from somewhere else, from the other. In that sense, it is indirect. So that's my first point. And what we think of as direct communication actually is made possible by something vastly and complexly indirect, which is language itself. Uh, and then the second thing uh, that uh, we need to need to keep in mind in sort of questioning, interrogating the schema of a simple um, delivery of a message from one side to the other is that uh, that this kind of a delivery of a purely spatial transaction from one side to the other does not take into account the specificity of that medium through which all communication takes place, which is time. All communication takes place through a kind of movement, not in space at all, but in time. So even when I'm speaking to you now, Actually, what I am really going through and you are receiving what I am saying is through the element of time. Time is where we are really interacting. What does it mean to say time? Time means that at every moment that a word is uttered, in that moment that word is also received in the sense of a particular meaning, and that meaning is also transformed in the next word that is uttered. That's why there is a continuous transformation of synthesis or transformation and synthesis in how the final meaning is. It is not something static, not something that has a simple, in the, like in the spatial image, a simple combination of meanings that you pack up in a box and send it across to your, uh, to your partner in dialogue. But actually what is happening is in a dialogue, even between two individuals, something else is at play, which is the play of time, in which the other person is implicated in that time as much as the speaker is. This uh, particular phenomenon of time is most um, interestingly and sometimes beautifully revealed in the act of listening. You know. When we listen to something that is being spoken, then do we, how do we listen? Do we listen to something that is being spoken as a kind of, uh, in, in the sense of something which is, a, uh, which is the entire thing in one, in, as, a, as a piece, you know, which is of a piece, the whole meaning as a single unit? No, surely not. When we listen, what we do is we listen to a particular kind of a particular kind of uh, trial and error. At every moment that we listen, we also are uh, trying to guess what the other person is not only saying, but is going to say further. And this happens in the most, uh, you know, ridiculously banal everyday situations. I'll give you an example, which is a bit ridiculous, but very, very real. Uh, every day I come to my office uh, in, in, my, in my university, you know, I take 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 uh, a particular uh, you know a public transport with an auto scooter or something, and there is a, what is called a T crossing, a T point where you either go to the left or the right, which um, which I meet, and then I have to tell my the one who's driving me to turn left towards my office. So every day I say this to the person who's driving: that turn left. It's a simple instruction: turn left. Now, in at least 50% of cases, the person who is driving turns right instead of left. And then I have to correct that person, say, no, 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 I said left, not right. And then that person says, oh, oh so sorry, yeah, yeah, of course. And, you know, goes in the right direction. Why such a, does such a thing happen? 
It's not a question of simply mishearing that he heard right. No, it's because when I, and it's something I, I thought about, but initially it was something quite puzzling to me. But then I thought about it and it seemed perfectly logical. When we, for instance, tell someone that, oh, now turn left. Left already comes with its opposite or its, its kind of partner as a word in, in vocabulary, which is what? Right. So when the person is listening, which is happening in time, you're saying left, but by the time the word reaches the listeners, uh, the listener, then in the listening, the person is not simply listening to left. The person is listening to left as part of a structure, which is left as, which is the opposite of right. So it's not illogical that within the mind of the listener, in the kind of temporal synthesis, there can be a certain strange kind of vacillation, confusion. But did he say right? Did he say left? Because you're not only hearing left, you're hearing left as part of structure, which is already always coupled with right. So that's why it's not illogical for someone to get into some sort of a confusion in one's head and instead of turning left, turn right. Because it's a temporal synthesis. It's not the simple information of left which is coming to you. The all information comes as part of a synthesis which takes place in time. Now, of course, this is a very interesting example, uh, in a, in a, at least potentially, and I'll just mention it here, uh, with, uh, with, a, with an auto at a T-crossing, left and right is all right. It's, it's quite, quite innocent. You can go right and left. But this can happen in very different contexts. The same thing, you know, uh, which, for instance, in a particular social context, uh, with a particular set of, you know, conflicts or debates and, stressful um, emotions flying around, uh, certain certain social identity terms that immediately evoke some other identity term, which it, it does not have to, but it does. It could. So I'll take an example from a distance from to begin with, and then we can come to examples closer to India. So for instance, uh, in, in the present context of the Ukraine-Russian um, war, uh, if you say Ukraine, then it's quite possible that Ukraine would, in the structure of that left-right structure, Ukraine would immediately come to you as coupled with Russia. You know, if you the Ukraine, you're thinking Ukraine, Russia, and in clearly a polarized sense that one is the so-called adversary of the other. It doesn't have to be like that. There's nothing essentially adversarial about. You know, any one name of a country and another, because all countries are historical entities with a lot of historical changes and so on and so forth. But in a particular conjuncture, it is possible that when you actually take an identity term, a national identity term, a social identity term, and so on and so forth, immediately what it uh, sort of uh, that particular uh, structure that it, in, it evokes involves its so called adversary or even enemy. And it seems as if this is a natural structure, which it is not. There is nothing naturally adversarial about Ukraine and Russia. And it, it can appear like that. This can become even worse if I don't say Ukraine, I say Ukrainian. And someone says Russian or thinks Russian as the other of or the, you know, again, the adversary or even the rival or the enemy or whatever of uh, Ukrainian. Even, and that is even more obviously ridiculous, because there cannot be anything intrinsically uh, polarized between Ukrainian and Russian. And yet, in specific conjunctures, uh, words come to us in these kinds of double binds, these kinds of highly polarized binary structures, which actually testify to two things. One, that communication takes place only in specific logical contexts which are cognitive contexts. Communication does not take place in a unilinear way. It always comes in a part of, as part of a cognitive structure. A cognitive structure means what? It means that we, when we listen to something, we listen to it through a set of structural oppositions or opposites or binary constructions. We don't listen to it in simple, uni, univocal, isolated ways. That's one. Second, it, it comes to us in specific historical and social contexts. 
So left and right at a decrossing is by and large without any historical and social context. It's, it testifies only to the cognitive structure that when I think of right, I think of it within the logical structure of including its opposite, which is left. But in a social or, 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 or a historical context, this can mean something far more serious and, 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 and critical, which is that I can think of, uh, I, can, I can use a specific identity term as part of language and build a structure around it, which is polarized, binary, adversarial, and so on and so forth, which it doesn't have to be. So that's why communication and dialogue have to be, in the most general sense, uh, thought of uh, as part of a uh, field of experience that is both historical, structural, cognitive, but also problematical, uh, which contains a certain threshold or what I will call undecidability. You can't already decide what to communicate without first trying out that piece of communication. That is the interesting thing about communication. Okay. Even when I'm trying to communicate something which is so simple and absolutely empirical that I have to go left, you know, I can only at the most try this out. Will the other guy listen to me or hear left or will he hear right or will he be kind of confused whether did I say left and right? Because left and right come together. I can only try out the mean. Communication is a kind of is a kind of wager, it's a kind of gamble. You know? And that's the reason why listening becomes so important. Listening becomes such a crucial thing in communication, uh, which is not to listen to what you're saying in terms of the content, but the very act of speech, in a sense, includes the challenge of listening. The very act of speaking includes the challenge of listening. This is most beautifully, that's why I also said that this idea of listening can be very beautiful. Uh, it's most beautifully seen in the art of acting, performance, uh, in cinema as well as in theater. I'll just take um, quick examples and finish my introduction before I get on to some specific um, sections of my talk. Um, so, you know, um, very good actors, really good actors, when they, uh, when they act, uh, and mostly acting is in, for particular in cinema, Hindi cinema, for instance, or Indian cinema, we usually say this as a matter of course, that, oh, uh, good actors speak dialogue so well, you know, and dialogue in general is seen as paradigmatic of the form of what we call drama in theater and cinema. But what is uh, what you actually see in excellent acting is uh, something which is not the act of speaking itself, so-called delivery of dialogue, but it is the, it is the, uh, it is the really the delicacy and truth of reacting to what the other person is saying, which only comes from listening. I'll give you an example of this in from the history of cinema. There was a film that was made in the 1970s, I think, called Marathon Man, which featured two very good actors, one very senior and at that time one very young actor. One, the young actor was Dustin Hoffman, and the great senior actor was Lawrence Olivier. Lawrence Olivier, uh, had a piece of dialogue to speak, and the writer of that uh, of the screenplay was there, you know, on set, and um, he's the one who actually narrated the story. Uh, Lawrence Olivier was given a, a line to speak, and he came to the writer and said, "Well, can I make you a request? Can I can I ask you to please add another word or shift the words a little bit at the very end?" because it makes me it easier for me to act. Now, initially the writer was very, I'm uh, not sure what, why this was, because it was a very ordinary line. Something, you know, I forget the line, but it's a very ordinary line. But he said, that Lawrence Olivier said, the reason I am asking for this is that when, so for instance, just uh, it, that was not the line from the film, but let's just take, take an example. So for instance, if uh, the line is, I'm acting, you know, 
someone who's talking to a friend. And I, I asked that friend, oh, how's the weather? And the friend says, uh, well, uh, it's not sunny. And so I have to make a reply to that. So Lawrence Olivier is saying when so my friend says, it's not sunny. So when he says, it is, I'm listening. He says, I'm listening. It is not, I'm listening. It is not sunny, I'm still listening. Because you see, if it is not sunny, and maybe the reason why I ask is I want to take a walk, that does not immediately tell me whether I can take a walk or not, because it could be raining, in which case taking a walk is not so easy. But that information has not come to me. It's just come as something which is a certain negative state. It is not sun. But I do not know what the weather is like, whether it's just the right weather so that I can immediately take it and say, okay, let's go take a walk. No, I have to listen. And I'm still listening to this, is what Olivier said, that even when the last word is spoken, I'm still listening. And that's why I need another word to fill up that kind of gap. Whatever that word it might have been in the film that I forgot. So this is the kind of precision with which the actor is working at, as part of his or her art which is not the art of simply delivering dialogues, but to make the act of listening within the larger idea of dialogue real and true. And there is a certain beauty to this. As the experience of you know, seeing good acting is, for instance, I mean, uh, in, in, in Hindi cinema, Dilip Kumar's acting is known for its genius, not just because of the beauty of his delivery, but because of the sheer the sheer power of his pauses. The sheer power of his pauses. Every pause he takes actually makes it palpable this guy is listening. You know? So this is by way of uh, my introduction to the general proposition that dialogue is not simply communication. But within common language, every act of what I called gambling on trying out communication, or trying out communication as a kind of gamble, itself produces certain effects. And those effects are always very interesting. Sometimes those effects are historically uh, extremely significant. But I would like to now take. Uh, First of all, uh, open up this uh, this idea of common language, uh, theoretically, you know, very, very minimally, um, some minimal references to reading and concepts, after which I want to take examples from common language and what uncommon effects common language might generate in specific contexts of what is this very interesting relationship between dialogue and communication. Those three um, um, examples, not examples, three sites that I, I will take are of common language and their uncommon effects are the sites of history, two religion, and third is law. But before I do that, I want to simply, you know, theoretically, uh, just um, talk a little bit about the notion of what the common language uh, might be. So one of the uh, one of the questions of language is that uh, uh, language is a kind of code. It's a kind of uh, it's a kind of uh, a matrix or a, a sort of arrangement of what a particular set of sounds uh, is meant to stand for. Uh, as indicating or standing for some sort of meaning, you know? Uh, so usually language is seen as a kind of correlation in sound, which uh, a linguist called Ferdinand Sastor, uh, he called acoustic image, uh, to uh, what he uh, so called signified, which is meaning, something like this. Acoustic image, that's the meaning, but 
course, uh, the interesting thing is that uh, this kind of uh, correlation is uh, arbitrary. That's why natural languages are, by and large, uh, examples of uh, arbitrary correlations between what is the sound of a word and what it is supposed to be. So there is no particular reason why rain should sound the way it does and refer to uh, the, the actual event of it raining. You know? So in general, in general, there are exceptions, but in general, that's what is called natural language. All the languages that we you know, uh, know of and a part of uh, are examples of arbitrary correlation. The highly structured, because one particular set of sounds has to, by and large, strictly stand for a set of meanings. But at the same time, the structure is an arbitrary structure because there is no intrinsic relationship between one and the other. So in a sense, uh, this is the first uh, feature of what could be called common language. Because uh, here, uh, we are not really talking about X language or Y language, this or that language. This is a general feature of all language. That is natural language. But of course, one could always point out that language uh, itself can mean something far more codified or far more uh, strict. So, for instance, if you speak of the computer language, you know, scientific language, um, alge algebraic language, then, uh, or symbolic language, then clearly the symbols, the, 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 the marks that you make on a paper when you want to write, to write something, all of that has far more exact reference to what it is supposed to refer to. Unlike, say, using the word rain or, you know, all the words that we use in a common um, natural language. So there is clearly a difference between natural language and more constructed, more artificial languages. But, and this is also, you could say, the distinction between, and there the word common can be changed for the word secular, uh, the distinction between a kind of secularity of language and a kind of non-secularity or specialization of that. I mean, this is something which is interesting uh, that we, in our use of the word secular, in uh, mostly political you know, discourse in India, particularly, uh, use the word secular in, uh, in opposition and relation to religion. So for instance, I mean, that example I took of this cognitive structure, you know, which brings left and right always together and as opposites. In India, in the, in the context of Indian history, and also probably in the context of modern history in general, when we say secular, more or less it comes with its problematical, if not adversarial relation with religious. But actually the word secular can mean something within language itself very specific. And that is secular is language which is common language in the sense of language as such, any language in its most open structure, in its most arbitrary open structure is secular. Why? Language, the more constructed it gets, the more spe specialized it gets, becomes less and less secular. Here, the opposite of secular is a kind of specialization in the sense of a kind of scientificity, a kind of, a kind of uh, saturation of meaning by a code, you know? So, so for instance, in computer language, you'll have very little ambiguity about the meaning of a code or what a code is supposed to refer to when a particular code is, uh, or a genetic code or any kind of a scientific code, which is also kind of language, but its meaning will not have the arbitrariness or the ambiguity <clears throat> or the undecidability that will exist in the use of the natural language. And that's a natural language as common language is both more secular and at the same time, less uh, specialized. But the interesting thing is that even with this idea of language as something which is uh, open and, and well secular in the sense, 
of something which uh, which open a certain kind of uh, certain kind of uh, trying out, like I said, trying out in the process of say a conversation, a dialogue, an interaction, an encounter, something which involves a kind of historical moment instead of being strictly codified, abstracted from all history. Uh, that kind of a common uh, uh, of common space or possibilities actually opens up something else which is which is not possible really in specialized language and that is what i'm calling the possibility of uncommon effects and this is the point that i'd like you to keep in mind when you have a very strict language a very what is called technically univocal language one thing means exactly what it does and nothing else and actually there are very little surprises it does take a lot more effort uh, tools uh, very very you know deep education and training and so on and so forth to grasp that language so not all of us can learn computer language or any kind of scientific language or language genetics and so on it takes a lot of training but more or less once that training is had i mean of course there are surprises everywhere because there's uncertainty everywhere no doubt uh, not in, in or in science, not less, I completely agree with that. Nevertheless, more or less, even the even the surprise is calculable. This is the thing with science, that even the surprise is subject to a certain calculability. So in that sense, non-secular specialized language includes in itself a certain language for the uncommon something that is unexpected. This is not the case with common language. And that is why the notion of the uncommon becomes so interesting and so inseparable from common language. And I, I want to take examples from uh, these areas, which uh, are not in that sense strictly from the field of science. So I have absolutely uh, uh, no quarrel with science on the contrary. I learn so much from science all the time. So this, this is the point uh, I'd like you to remember, Derek, that uh, it is with common language that we actually find a, a certain kind of uh, undecidability or an arbitrariness, uh, almost a certain equivocity, as opposed to the university of specialized language, non-secular language. But it is only with this kind of uh, an equivocity of common language that we also find the possibility of something which I'm going to try and show is uncommon. And there'll be examples of this from different areas, but the main point is not that these are only empirical examples from different areas and from different contexts. The main point is, and this is what I started out with, that all of this will actually uh, refer to something which is our own constitution as human beings. In that sense, our anthropological constitutions. All of this, when we speak of common language, you're not really speaking of an empirical uh, fact of language, which is always there, but language is part of our constitution, as part of our human constitution, which is both extremely unstable and extremely uh, you know, on the edge and precarious and so on and so forth. And at the same time, it attests, attests to a capacity of something which I started out by saying, which is, which is to respond to this very precarity with creativity, with a certain kind of courage, with a certain kind of experimentation, and that is the interesting thing about dialogue. Dialogue not as a, as, as a way of simply, uh, you know, ensuring that, oh, we are on the same page, we agree, or we don't agree. But it is that we are not so sure whether we do or we don't, but we can show some courage and some will to experimentation as we go along without having any guarantees about how it's all going to end up. This is the kind of idea or the kind of general milieu within which 
I am trying to speak today. Uh, so one of the, I mean, uh, readings that I sent across, uh, of course, these are very specific readings and they come from context and I don't have to, you know, go into the scholarly details, but just some, some people might be interested. The idea of free indirect discourse, language is indirect discourse, and I'll, I'll use that idea a little later, comes from uh, an, a, 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 very interestingly, uh, certain research, uh, uh, a historical epoch of researches into, into language studies, you know, uh, during a revolutionary period in modern European history, which is during the Russian Revolution. And a lot of uh, research was going on into language at that time. So one of the, and surely you must have read him or discussed him in, in your earlier sessions. One of the most, uh, one of the key figures of this epoch was a person called Mikhail Bakhtin, who uh, is known to be probably uh, arguably the, the most important uh, writer on, on dialogism, what you call dialogism. The idea of dialogue as not just, like I said, between a uh, conversation between two people to fix fixed entities, but as a field of multiplicity. He called it polyphony. A, f a field of, of voices rather than two voices as absolutely discrete and simply separated within a field of what called dialogism or even more beautifully called it the imagination of dialogue the dialogical imagination well it is uh, he was writing in the 1920s and 30s you know and uh, he had a very fraught relationship with the soviet state the new soviet state now among others and this is this is a story that has to be told separately, but I'll just mention it to indicate it. Uh, because of, uh, of the times uh, that uh, during those days, because the state had so much interest in intellectual in, in intellectual propositions and intellectual developments of that time, but also wanted to really scrutinize all of that, whether it was all uh, it was all contributing to the revolution or was. Um, in any way damaging the revolution and so on and so forth. The intellectuals were all also really threatened by the state. So a lot of intellectuals, linguists included, worked anonymously or even used pseudonyms. You know, they used new names, false names. Yeah, they created masks for themselves. So one such name that emerges that very period is a name called Volosinov who wrote a book called Marxism and the Philosophy of Language. Now, this is a very deep and complex and wonderful contribution to the study of Marxism and language, which was an issue with Russian society at that time, Russian intellectual developments of that period, where it was a matter of great debate whether language should be included in what Marxism called the mode of production, you know, the infrastructure. Or is the infrastructure only to be seen through the eyes of economy? Was language outside there? Language entirely belongs to culture? Or is language something irreducible? Language is in the same way, at the same level as our means of livelihood. This was such a fascinating debate that was going on at that time. Polosinov wrote a book about this. But we are not so sure who Polosinov was or is. Some people say he could be Bhakti, but no one is quite certain about that. You know? But this is something which, uh, just as a matter of tickling your interest in such things. Uh, anyway, so Volosinov in his book, Marxism and Philosophy of Language, actually coined this term indirect discourse. Language is free indirect discourse. Language is not, like I started out by saying, simply a field where you take control of language as if it's your property. And then you have these degrees of control. Oh, English is a foreign language. Oh, Hindi is uh, my closer language. Or oh, Bengali is my mother tongue. I have control over it. And I'm now going to deliver my meanings to my mother tongue or through English because it's a global language and so on and so forth. 
Well, all of that is also very important, of course, no, no doubt about that. But the point is, whether it's English or Bengali or Hindi or whichever other language, in Velocino's, uh, in Velocino's understanding, they're all part of something which is a social field, which already structures where I am placed. In that sense, it's indirect. But it's also very interesting that it contains a degree of freedom. That's why in language, there is already a possibility of transformation. So there is so much in language that I can use. So there is so much redundancy in language. Always a lot of redundancy. I need to use only a very small part of language, you know, to do what I am wanting to do. But because there is so much redundancy, there's also so much creativity. Because there are so many combinations that I can make out of language. But that combination which testifies to my freedom is only possible because of the existence of something indirect and a kind of field over which I can have ever, I can never have sovereign control. You know, this is what, this is what Velocinov uh, really on the pioneeringly called the capacity for free indirect force, which much later, uh, certain French thinkers in the 1980s uh, used uh, in a, a volume that came out, a very influential volume called Capitalism and Schizophrenia, Volume 2, uh, A Thousand Plateaus, written by Gilles Dellers and Felix Guattari, in which they had a chapter called Postulates of Linguistics, in which they used the velocity of idea of free direct discourse to actually analyze very specific effects of language in the field of history, religion, politics, law, war, journalism, media, cinema, and so on and so forth. So what I'm going to do now uh, briefly um, next half an hour and uh, is to take examples and there are some Indian contexts will be uh, deaf and maybe a little bit contemporary we'll see uh, will be will be will be uh, also there and you can ask me questions later for clarification if you want uh, which will be well analysis of certain contexts uh, but with this larger idea right, which is a field of free and direct discourse in which Specific acts of creativity we have called gamble or wager or courage to try out something, but in situations which are problematical, which are not clear, which are not, you know, entirely determined and decided. Uh, of course, I mean, example, the example, we must start with an example just to keep the 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 the, the fundamental obvious the, the clarity of these concepts these concepts are not the very clear concepts they are not just convoluted you know uh, jargon uh, so for instance uh, one of the examples that is taken as an example of free indirect discourse is example of love so individuals in language they uh, declare love for each other you know? Uh, the act of saying, I love you, in a sense, changes everything between two people. One is not even sure this is a dialogue. It's like a yeah, something that is a sudden force. Someone might call it violent. Someone might call it, you know, something which is wonderful, but something which is absolutely, which, 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 which doesn't take place in, in, in any, uh, in, in any codified or predictable way at all. But the, the act of saying, I love you, is an act of uh, uh, newness in between two people. But you'll notice that these three words, I love you, are the most common words you can ever think of in any language. Here we are speaking of English, but even if you take the field of translation, you know, these are by and large the most common words you can think of. There is nothing in these words that is new or creative. And yet, every time it is actually spoken, and it's probably spoken, it's being spoken as we speak 
countless times all over the world. Every time it's spoken, something new happens. Good, bad, violent, beautiful, uh, confusing, I do not know. That's a different story. But something new happens. This is an example of free and direct discourse. It is because the apparatus of language which carries these words is absolutely, its, its redundancy is totally on us, upon us. You cannot but be within that redundancy. So many words are there we don't have to use. I don't have to say I love you all the time. It's just there. And sometimes, rarely I do it, I say it. And when I do, everything changes, which some philosophers call event. That rare moment when I do something, use something which I don't use, you know, for hundreds of years. It's just part of the redundancy of the structure within which I place. And yet, once I use it, and everything changes. So the language event and language are not the same. What the event does is that it actually reveals to us the great field within which we are always placed. You know? But, oh, so much was possible with language that I said something and everything changed. It reveals to us, not just our emotions vis-a-vis -vis love and so on with the other person and so on, but it reveals to us our very fundamental generic position in language itself, common language itself. This is an example of common language as constitutive of uncommon effect which is not really possible with scientific language. But I'm not going to talk about love in this. In This This is just an example. I'm going to talk about three, uh, three things, very briefly. First, I'll talk about history. Now, history is a common word. Now, it is true that different cultures and different traditions have very different uh, meanings to give to the word history. Again, I don't want to enter into deep scholarly, you know, caverns, uh, but just a, as a quick, uh, quick instantiation, if you were to uh, think of the word uh, in Greek, uh, then the word history can mean both chronicle, but also story. Yeah, so it is not necessary uh, that history is only what we think of or could think of as documented fact or documentation of facts. It could also mean something like a story, like a narrative. But again, in the word history, none of this is absolutely given to us as clearly delineated. It's clearly, you know, one as this, as different from that. That's why it's common language. Uh, and the, there could also be the issue of translation. Yeah, is the Hindi itihas saying? as history. We could enter these sorts of comparative philology, uh, philological discussion also. Yeah. Uh, and this can also be done culturally, you know, different religious traditions, and I'll talk about religion separately also, uh, for instance, theological traditions, which are uh, based on the idea of something like a salvation, salvational time, you know, in history that something will happen which will open up salvation for all mankind, all humanity, which basically takes place with the monotheistic. It does make a very different structure out of time, of you know, time of the world, from uh, let's say time that is understood uh, in very specific local senses. So Greeks, all pre-Christian pre, uh, Greeks, you know, the ancient Greeks did not think of uh, any of the cultures outside of that particular small space of island, you know, those island cities as civilized or possessing any kind of coherence of any kind of constitutive capacity for building anything. Uh, they're absolutely ethnocentric at that time. Absolutely ethnocentric. And yet within that ethnocentrism, they developed democracy. That is also a fact. You know, so for them, history was limited to as geography, which is the geography of ancient Greece. They did not think of history as 
uh, at all belonging to some you know, world time or time of everyone. So we could go into each of these distinctions at the same time when we start off with a discussion today, for instance, in the sense of, let's say, having a dialogue on history, that do we take history to be a common word or not? Or do we have a choice about this matter? Is there any other way of taking history but as a common word? But like it or not, history is a word we cannot not use. You know, you could say this is a kind of irreducible impact, however, you know, uh, problematical and, and, and ambiguous that impact might be of modernity. That all modern, all modernity is a kind of historical consciousness. Even though modernity is what brings colonial violence and imperialism and all kinds of discriminations world, on a world scale, Yet it's something which you cannot avoid in talking, uh, in having discussions. So in that sense, history is a kind of common word. The point here is that when we say common word, we're actually saying common word in that sense that I mentioned earlier, as a secular word, a word with no demands for having very razor edged scientific meaning. At this level, you do not demand that, no, no, but you must tell me what is your philosophy of history or what is your scholarly definition of history. No. You are able to really sustain your discourse at the level of how anyone, anyone will use the word history. With all its ambiguity and uncertainty, and yet the word history will be there in usage. You know. So in that sense, common language, and here the example of history is uh, what we're talking about, must, must testify to also a certain kind of stamina, sustainability of staying at the level of common language. Easily, we can move into specialized language. And we say, no, 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 only historians can talk about history. Yeah, because they know exactly what is history, because the rest of us, we just say history in some, you know, big sense. But historians know what exactly is the method of history. That is true. That is true. That is the whole point. Historians know what that method is, or at least they try and know what that method is. But the point is, they know that method only because there is already history in the sense of a common word, in the sense of common discourse in our times, which was not the case always. That I completely agree. And I gave examples of why it was not. So is it possible to sustain a, dis a discussion, a dialogue, on the on the fundamental basis of this commonness of the of the of the not just the fact of history but the word history? This is the first question that arises in our times again and again. You know, well, <clears throat> in the nineteen sixties and seventies, this question, uh, even within the discussions of historiography, and uh, some of you probably are students of history, scholars of history, so you'll be able to you know, enter into discussions about this yourself. Uh, some people um, in the 60s and 70s were starting to write more and more, not so much about actual historical studies and historiographical accounts of all kinds of things that were going on uh, in modern historical studies all over the world but about the very question of the language of history writing. So in the 1960s, uh, 66, I think, first time, an English uh, writer called Hayden White uh, brought out a book or a, a series of essays and later a book, which uh, spoke of our history as interestingly as figurative. History is not an immediate representation or mirroring or recording of fact. It's just something which is actually an act of language. It's a very radical thing that is said, and it provoked a lot of debate in the 1960s. And since then, can history be really 
seen as an act of language? Wouldn't that take away from the very ground of history, which is to do with real, so-called real things that happen in, you know, time, in life? And yet Hayden White and later others spoke of history as something which is constructed in language, through language, not just through language, not any kind of language, but language in that figurative sense. Now, what does figurative mean? Figurative means very, you know, broadly, something which is literary, something which contains figures of speech. So historians use language with those same features, which, for instance, a poet does or a dramatist, a, a, you know, someone who writes uh, plays does, a dramatist. In, in a certain kind of literary vocabulary, they are called tropes. So his, does history possess tropes? What is, why are we asking this question? What is the significance of this question? Well, the significance is that it colors, not colors really, it, it, it produces a different perspective on what we think of as scientific facts or scientific acts as grasp of facts. You know, because if history is to have a scientific grasp of facts, that did such a thing happen? Did a particular war take place? Did a particular king, you know, rule in a certain way or another way 500 years back? All of these are apparently questions of fact. And through documents, you're meant to get a grasp on those facts. And now, instead of primarily talking about that, if you ask the question, but the historian who is, you know, presenting all this, which are the figures of speech he or she uses? What is the kind of style of presentation? Then apparently you are, you're, you're going into something really minor and 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 uh, 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 extrinsic. So that's only to to you know make the the story the narrative a little more pleasing to read or hear. Uh, not really the issue of science and fact. And yet, uh, it was said with a lot of uh, lucidity that historians are actually creating discourses which do not immediately show facts, but which have what could be called the effect of a certain kind of truth, a kind of truth effect, not the presentation of truth or the mirroring of truth or the pure scientific evidence of truth, but a kind of truth effect. Truth is also an effect, rather than truth being simply a state. So, of course, this becomes really, really sort of on the edge, no? Because it makes truth look a little bit like rhetoric, a little bit like art, a little bit like performance. Can history, history writing be thought of as a kind of performance? Would that be a scandal? In India, this debate was really uh, taken up a little later. You know? uh, during the phase of what is called uh, subaltern history writing, uh, in the earlier phase of history writing, uh, the great historians like Romila Thapar and uh, so on and so forth, uh, they at that time did not really participate in this sort of a debate. Uh, uh, it was, it was in the, later in the 1980s with the subaltern historians coming into the picture and certain literary scholars like Sigatri Chakravarti Spivak, uh, who was a great literary and philosophical scholar, but contributing to um, the history writing of the school called Subaltern School, writing, who brought in to the, uh, in, into these discussions these, these particular uh, perspectives, these rhetorical perspectives, literary perspectives, but not just for the sake of stylistic discussions, but for the sake of what I already mentioned for conveying that actually truth is very much a question of history, but the truth is an effect. Truth is not a simple mirroring of a fact. It is an effect. So truth is at stake. One is not saying truth is not important to history. On the contrary, history is absolutely concerned with truth. But truth is not the same thing as saying that, oh, it's out there and I can actually, you know, truthfully convey it or I can't. No, truth is an effect through which I, in a sense, create 
and that becomes the second stage of his argument, historical subject. So that's why history also creates, and that is the really, really sort of tricky part of all this and probably dangerous part of all this. History also creates a certain kind of emotional emotions. Truth also produces emotions. This shifts the ground from history as cognition to history as identification. With something which apparently you have no reason to identify with. You know, something in the past. It is gone. So the only interest you should have in that is cognitive. You know? It seems something in the past through a kind of communicative language and scientific tools we get access to as far as possible. And if you can't get access to it beyond the point, we mentioned that as part of our critical modesty. But suppose we say that no, to whatever we're doing as historians, we're also producing the space for subjects in the present, we in a sense become partisans of history. Some people say, oh, it is that part of history that comes to us as our true legacy. And the other part is what we want to kind of expunge from our history or take out, that all of these create a completely different meaning and a different effect of history. So in that sense, one of the things that was brought out by this debate of history as discourse was not so only the writing of history and its stylistic, um, you know, literary and stylistic dimensions, but it brought out something which was a certain shift from the cognitive dimension of history to the more uh, subjective dimension of history. And in a way, it also, it, it also brought out the very reason to, to create a certain discourse of history. And in a sense, is it possible to create a dialogue with the past itself? Now, this is, this is a very important question, you know. How is it possible to create a dialogue with the past? Because clearly, the one, side, one, one side of the relationship is empty. One partner in that dialogue is not present, which is the past. How do you create a dialogue in the absence of one of the partners? And yet, in a way, a historian does that all the time. And this is something which, uh, which um, certain kinds of writers brought out very, very, very powerfully and very subtly. Hayden White is one of them. There was another writer who was not a historian at all, but a great philosopher from France called uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard, who wrote probably the first book, which a uh, small book in the 1970s, which made the word postmodern uh, so famous, he wrote a book called The Postmodern Condition, A Report on Knowledge, in which he said, actually, all of the idea of uh, our modern age being the result of universal human progress, moving towards a certain kind of uh, general, you know, a general uh, triumph of uh, historical, the historical march of humanity through technology, through uh, all kinds of other means of progress uh, is nothing but, again, a narrative strategy. He called it a meta-narrative, that actually history is nothing but meta-narrative. It's a way of telling a story. So progress could be understood, of course, in a very specific scientific terms, but if you have a general imagination that human beings are progressing, then that is actually a story, which can only appeal or be synthesized by the imagination, not demonstrated by fact. You know? So that's why uh, when, when uh, Jean-Francois Riotard said that this kind of narrative strategy he also call it grand narrative strategy, is now finally demystified. We know it for what it is. So it has also come to a crisp. 
He also called it the closure of or the end of modernity, from which the postmodern condition emerges. But you see, the postmodern condition does not emerge as another A. Postmodern condition emerges as, in a sense, a continuous awareness of this kind of narrativity, of this kind of linguistic play. So it does not emerge as another language or another history or another model of writing history and so on and so forth. No, it simply emerges as a continuous narrative awareness, an intense linguistic awareness, an intense rhetorical awareness, an intense discursive awareness of everyone who is involved in knowledge. That's why it's called a report on knowledge. All knowledge. And it has immediate bearing on what we call education, global education. All global education either is a grasping of fact. Economy is grasping of what we think of economic fact. Uh, history is a grasping of historical fact. Biology is a grasping of biological fact. And so it goes. Either it is that or knowledge is not a direct grasping of fact, but it is to make fact into a particular kind of grid of explanation, which is convincing, persuasive, only within certain discursive parameters, linguistic parameters of that particular, what another philosopher called Ludwig Wittgenstein called language game. History has its own language game, and biology might have a different language game. But these are all games of language. You know, so it's the so-called postmodern condition then makes, and that becomes a very, very sort of um, thing of to look at with great suspicion. Makes everything as if relative to that. If we make a claim for, for instance, X religious structure existed at a particular time. And a counterclaim that X structure was built uh, as a result of destroying some earlier structure. And instead of uh, moving into the historical question of which is a fact and which is not, you say each of these claims is nothing but a language game. It is only an effect of a particular narrative strategy that you use. Then what happens? This is a question that you know one might discuss as part of a dialogue with history. So we don't have the time to go into this, but it's something we can think about. Why? Because it is it has it has very important implications. For instance, if you say that it's only a result of language game, then in a way you are neutralizing the question. That no claim has any other has more weight than any other because they are just uh, the 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 the, the uh, uh, effic efficacy of language. So in that sense, they only testify to something which, again, is a kind of cognitive capacity of us being able to use language in many ways, in several ways. The trouble is, and that's why a lot of historians have a, a deep quarrel with what they think is postmodern uh, relativism and a kind of postmodern superficial wishy-washy thinking, doesn't go into the real thickness of things, is that but history is not about simply making claims. History about is about making claims and actually doing things, you know, producing a certain effect in history or breaking a structure, creating some other thing, making another structure or other kinds of things. 10,000 things happen in history and they really do. Then how can, and that ha they happen not in, in the distant past, but in the very neighborhood of your own present. And how can you say everything is a function of language? Can dialogue then be completely relative to language games? Or does dialogue have to take into account that real problematical but unavoidable question of the real, of that moment in the real? You know? Now, whichever way you want to look at this, one of the things that uh, is very clear is that, that in, in this kind of in this kind of a um, thinking about dialogue with the past, the real important thing remains that you are situated in language in the present. 
either language is inadequate to deal with something which is like, like a trauma, and language has to search for the ways of meeting that trauma. Historians have to find the, the discursive means to, to, to address that trauma in time. Something has really happened. You don't know how to make sense of it. Yeah. Or that history is not simply the reality coming to us as fact, but history is a weaving of language as different narrative strategies. Whatever that might be, it is not simply the science of knowing a fact or not knowing a fact. So it's not cognition in that kind of a pure scientific sense. And yet it is cognition, but complicated by the entry of language. So dialogue with the past, uh, then, uh, it seems to me, uh, is something which can only take place through language in the present. But at the same time, Language in the present can only have a relationship to the past if language is not the only thing that fills up this void in time. Something like the real, the unreconciled real, the trauma of the real remains uh, a, 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 kind of, a kind of challenge, remains a kind of uh, thorn which you do not disavow, which you do not uh, try and, you know, um, sort of lie to yourself. There's no such thorn as that. It's all just pleasant discussion or playing the game of language. This is something which even great scientific historians are increasingly sensitive to now, or at least they should be, even in the Indian context. The great historians I mentioned, Romila Thapar, uh, uh, I, I, I heard her uh, a few years in the past, uh, a, a few years back in GNU, we talked to the great Carlo Ginsberg, you know, and uh, they they belong to very different linguist, uh, sorry, historical traditions of of thinking about um, history and language. Carlo Ginsberg, coming from a tradition of uh, this kind of what I just talked about, um, of meta history and looking at history through uh, linguistic means and Romila Thapar belonging to the great tradition of a kind of materialist scientific history. And yet I heard them have one of the most illuminating and luminous conversations. With, uh, uh, those, they, they, they think so differently about these things because uh, in that sense, it was a real experience, a pleasure of listening to a dialogue between two great historians uh, on the very question of history and life. You know, uh, so that's that's one. Now, uh, very closely related to language is the question of religion. Now, religion is another uh, is another common word. It seems. To me. So I'll go very quickly now because I think I've taken a lot more time than I wanted to. Uh, recently, I was in Kolkata and I was talking to a very good scholar, great scholar of uh, Indian, Indian, Indian uh, um, texts of religion and philosophy. And, uh, and he had a very legitimate complaint that the very word religion does not, uh, uh, does not uh, suit or is not appropriate um, for uh, what we call dharma in Hindu, in, in Hindu uh, you know, for Hindu texts. The word dharma does not at all um, translate as religion. And the very word religion does not, is not appropriate for um, the kind of traditions that for instance, Hinduism um, is part of. So for him, the scholar, my friend, uh, religion should really be confined to the paradigm of monotheistic religions, you know, the great monotheistic religions, instead of being applied to, say, some Indic, Hindu, or other kinds of, of policies, and other sorts of religions. He was unhappy with the very use of the word uh, religion in these in such discussions, and this, of course, then can be further uh, illustrated through the specific discussions one has on the question of religion and theology, and religion and social segregation, caste, and so on and so forth. Um, now, if you contrast this with, let's say, one of the great Indian uh, public intellectuals and 
critics of traditional uh, traditional uh, Hindu traditional Hindu society, um, B. R. Ambedkar, uh, you will find that he uses the word religion absolutely without any difficulty all the time. Not just with reference to Hinduism, he does it with Christianity, with reference to other kinds of contexts, but also with Hinduism and uses it very critically and criticizes Hinduism uh, and so on and so forth. But that criticism, I'm not going to go into much, but the fact that he uses religion absolutely unconscious, without any difficulty, something that is a fact. So how does one think about this? It seems to me, again, we need to differentiate between, in the same word, say religion, its, its effectivity as common language and its specific conceptual and philological, um, in that sense, scientific uh, um, uh, reference or its world of referential, its referential world. Yes, it is true that in its referential uh, specificity, the word religion can be, for instance, uh, drawn from greatly from monotheistic context. And not the word dharma may not, and I'm not a scholar of this at all, so I will not make any assertions about it. But I'm saying it's possible that the word dharma uh, does not at all translate it. Uh, religion well, and the reason that it became popularly known as, uh, you know, as the same as religion is because of the Orientalist uh, colonial intervention in the 18th and 19th century. That is absolutely possible. It's a good historical hypothesis. But at the same time, whatever be the, the historical reasons why this happened, the fact that the word religion in English eventually surrounds us and determines our very entry into this conversation between Hinduism and Hindu social structure and Hindu in, in relation to other comparative religions of its time and so on and so forth, is only possible if the word religion is taken as common language. And Ambedkar, it seems to me, does so very robustly with a clean conscience. He's not saying that it is the, it is the best translation of dharma or not. He's saying at the, in the first place, that is not our interest. Our interest is to start a discussion, start a dialogue, start a critical engagement. For which we, we have no choice and we have no difficulty about not having a choice, but being placed in common language. Whether it be Orientalist, whether it be uh, in its in its genealogy, in its origins, in its genesis, all of that is part of a critical self-awareness. And Ambedkar surely had more than and not less of that awareness. And yet, it is not a fundamentally scholastic, in the sense that I explained, non-secular preoccupation that Ambedkar takes up to immediately, in a sense, subtract from words, subtract from religion. So don't use religion, use some other word. Now, of course, later Ambedkar, when he becomes a Buddhist or writes about Buddhism, will actually engage with the word dharma and dhamma. He'll do that. Sure. But that does not mean he's doing it in, a, in the sense of purifying the wrong word religion or the impure word religion that has come from Orientalist context. That is not his interest. Because for him, something which comes through a very problematic history nevertheless becomes common resource. And it is only common resource, as common resource, that you can make that problematical history come to light. And not doing the other thing, which is that to censor words or to excise words, to subtract from words because of their problematical history. So one of the conditions for a dialogue within religion becomes possible only when religion is taken to be, in a sense, part of common language which in no way impinges on something else, which is the more sort of subjective and substantive part of religion as an object of faith, object of belief. He was a critic of Hinduism, we know that. That does not make him say, oh, but Hinduism is not really a religion, it is something else. 
saying it is a religion and there are problems with it. Or there is a whole religious critique that one can, uh, a critique of religion that can be carried out uh, vis-a-vis um, Hindu social practices and even Hindu theology. Uh, so, so uh, this, 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 of course, there is, I, we don't have the time, but I will just mention the other great figure from the, the emancipatory traditions of uh, critique of Hinduism um, uh, as part of the anti-caste movement is Jyotiba Phule, who wrote a very strong text and a very sort of interesting text called uh, On Slavery, in which, again, he used the dialogue form very interestingly. It's a fictionalized text where two people are talking to each other, basically discussing Hindu texts, great Hindu texts, and in a way demystifying them. So when Hule does that, that act of demystification, again, though Hule's interest is not really in religion in the sense that religion is a consolidated um, idea or a consolidated word, uh, Hule is more interested in the specific narrative strategies of Hindu texts and to demystify them. Uh, nevertheless, insofar as all of that do consolidate themselves into broadly something like Hinduism, there's no problem in calling Hinduism a religion and then making it the springboard for a, a certain critique. Even if my scholar friend is right that philologically there is something inadequate about thinking of Hinduism through the category of it, or even Hinduism as Hinduism, because both come together in a certain kind of, you know, a certain kind of history which, about which I'm not competent to talk. The reason why I, you know, talk about this is just to open up this question of dialogue about religion, which is not so uh, squeamish, which is not so worried about using the word religion, and yet does not use the word religion in the other sense, which is one which immediately pitches it on the side of faith, hurt sentiments, um, you know, something which is strong belief structure. No, neither but use it in the sense of a common word. Third and final point is to do with uh, law, which of course makes it uh, even more difficult to discuss uh, because in law, apparently things are already highly specialized. Religion, they can start off at a very common level because people generally have you know, some relationship to religion. Uh, uh, even if they're not theologians. But with law, apparently, we are already in a space of something highly specialized, uh, which is which also contains a specialized vocabulary and institutional specialization and so on and so forth. And yet, a certain kind of public dialogical logos, that kind of milieu, which makes law discussable as part of not specialized discussion, but discussion within common language, is something so real, uh, not just important, but so real in our own times, that we cannot but look at law in the same way that I've been trying, you know, in this talk. One of the concepts that Jean-François Lyotard uses in another text that he calls the different it's sorry, I, I I'm not able to show you slides, but you should just uh, tell it. It's not different. It's D I F F E R E N D, different. And Jean Francois Lathar says that there are certain kinds of situations of discourse where the the the, the conflict, the contestation, the disagreement becomes so strong, so uh, extreme that your language becomes incommensurable, incommensurable with the other's language. So this is actually the structural failure of dialogue, the end of dialogue, in a sense. But Lyotard asks the question, but it's only in such particular situations, which is a situation of, a situation of crisis, that the real question of dialogue must arise. And to me, this is the most important thing that I can sort of present to you. Dialogue must, the thinking of dialogue 
must take place exactly when dialogue is impossible. François Lyotard calls it, vis-à-vis -vis law in particular, the situation of the different. When difference becomes something not adjudicable, adjudicable, you can't adjudicate difference at the level of uh, or with the tools of a specific given uh, language of agreement. How do you adjudicate it? But everything starts off with that challenge. How does it? You know? This seems to me to be, an, you know, on the, on, on the eve of the India, in the Republic Day, uh, it, it is not an irrelevant discussion to talk about this. When uh, we speak of the law, uh, not just in terms of uh, its clauses and its, uh, its, its implementation, but we also speak of it in a more public sense, which is its jurisprudence. It's rationality, it's logos, which itself is not merely legal, you know. So that's why it is absolutely imperative that law be part of dialogue. And yet, law is exactly where a certain kind of ordinary dialogue after a point becomes very difficult. Now, one of the things that, uh, so I can, I can end with a very, um, Clear example of what is of controversy at present, which is that: uh, uh, is it possible to really uh, think of a constitution, a legal constitution, or a constitution that makes possible a law, as something uh, which is uh, which is fixed around which a dialogue takes place, or can there be a dialogue which is absolutely unconditional, open-ended about? Uh, even changing constitutions. You know, this is a kind of, at one level, fascinating philosophical and theoretical debate, at another level, historical and maybe somewhat perilous, dangerous debate to have. But it is a debate that is not absent in our context. So might as well, uh, at the end of my talk, uh, talk about it briefly. Uh, now, you see, the thing is that if one were to look at this in terms of purely legal provisions of a constitution, say the Indian constitution, then clearly dialogue has to take place within the constitution, A, as it is laid down, and two, as the constitution is interpreted by those very institutions which the constitution prescribes. Say, for instance, the legislature and the uh, executive, but also, very crucially, the, 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 the judiciary, as it interprets the law, interprets the constitution, which over time can also change. And yet it is the same constitution. And of course, you can always go into details about uh, but the constitution can be amended and so on and so forth. But there, a specific question has come up in the present and it keeps coming up. But here it is the same constitution. How does one ensure that that sameness of the constitution in its essence gets a certain kind of constituted form. So eventually in Indian history, recent history, we have a form or a formulation called basic structure, something which is a basic structure. It came much later, but that formulation was made by the court, Supreme Court. In that sense, we are saying we're still talking about the same constitution, even if the constitution does get amended, amended. All that is absolutely possible and fine, but it's still the same constitution insofar as it has the same structure, basic structure. Yeah. So all dialogue has to take place within the basic structure, uh, you know, under, the, under that condition. Now, if you were to say, just as a thought experiment. But suppose we let go of this condition of the basic structure. And we talk about the constitution unconditionally in terms of a you know, dialogue on possible change. Then what happens? Then what is it that we're going to talk about? Sure, we can talk about specific, you know, 
sections of the constitution, how they can change, and you can have dialogue between the public and the government and and the and the legal fraternity and so on and so forth. All that can happen, sure, but it is not at that level that we are talking about unconditioned, because those anyway happen within the conditions of the basic structure. When we attempt to think unconditionally, then what we're really saying is, can we think of a different jurisprudence? Different, to put it even more simply, different principle, a different preamble of any constitution that we might conceive different set of principles. So we've come to the last question and probably the most important one. Is it possible to have a dialogue on principles? On anything empirical, you can have dialogue and you must have dialogue with as many and as much tools as possible. This is what common sense tells us. Linguistic tools, but also other scientific tools. So in history, documents and tools of interpretation. Even in religion, texts, read texts as closely as possible. If you have to criticize a text. But what happens to principles? Principles are not really in texts. Texts can be based on principles. The principles are actually really productions of thought. They're not really in text. They're not really in a document. So what is it we really discuss or have a dialogue on when it's a question of a principle? This is really the question which is crucial and in a sense, the most challenging point uh, about dialogue and the fundamental question of the logos, the reason within which we are all supposedly placed when we are conducting a dialogue. So suppose, I'll just end with an example. Suppose we take the example that the principle now is that. So uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a present principle that's accept that human beings are fundamentally capable of living a collective, egalitarian, democratic life. Human beings are capable of doing that, governing themselves. In that sense, we are a democracy. We can arrange the democracy differently, but we are, we are a democracy in principle. Because our principle is human beings are capable of thinking, of doing things together, of sharing a common life. Right? Suppose the principle is changes. Because no, the principle is human beings are fundamentally incompetent. Human beings are fundamentally weak. Human beings are fundamentally foolish. Human beings are fundamentally, well, sinful. Hence, the principle of governing individual uh, human beings must come from some other superior sovereign source, whatever that source might be. Now you see, the principle is not really something uh, which uh, is uh, is. Uh, well, the principle has changed. The principle has changed. We are not really talking about clauses of law anymore. How does one conduct a dialogue there? Because there is no empirical material to to keep uh, to keep fighting over. So you can you can of course fight and also shed a, and lose a lot of blood over these fights, but still you can factually fight over whether a particular structure existed or did not exist at a particular point and what should be done about it and should we forget all that and so on and so forth. At least you can do all that on empirical grounds. But suppose you you come to a point when you say, oh, but I think that human beings are not capable. We need something else to govern human beings. Or the other one, that human beings are capable. Uh, in either case, it seems that this cannot be really uh, subject of an object of a dialogue. It is a kind of commitment. In mathematics, these are called axioms. You start from here. You don't, you don't really demonstrate them. You start from there. These are like axiomatic. You can always say, oh, so you say, no, human beings are equal. Someone said, no, no, but human beings are not equal. Look, some are tall and some are not tall. Now, if you 
if you actually make that empirical parameter of a particular of equality that you know height is a parameter of equality or inequality then it, it can apply that oh because some are taller than some other human beings and human beings are not equal if the parameter of equality is something else then you can also say human beings are equal but if you say equality is not based on parameters but it is a pure commitment it's the other way around if there is equality then you have to think about some people being taller than others differently not in terms of equality or inequality but in a different way some people would say in terms of difference egalitarian difference so from a principle you draw consequences and you can have dialogue on consequences but on principles there is is it possible to have dialogue or is it a matter of commitment this to me is one of the most important questions when it comes to the thinking of law and usually and this is where in a sense the limits of language are reached on principles uh, language plays a role up to a point but beyond a point you cannot really argue or you cannot really uh, win or lose a case to language games or through the means of language you after a point uh, really uh, appeal to something which in a sense is on the edge of language and yet probably has a life beyond language which is thought common language going to something like thought as the possibility of its most uncommon effect this to me is really the next stage of thinking about dialogue not at the level of language but with the question of thought so let me end with this elliptical proposition there are other things uh, which we can bring into this discussion but maybe that can happen in question answer session so thank you for your attention thank you so much sir for this very uh, thought provoking nice thought inspiring session and uh, we have two questions already kulsum would you like it uh, like to ask the question yourself or do i just read it out okay so kulsum's question is is history dialogic by nature or must we consciously i can ask okay good sorry sorry okay. yeah okay should i ask it yeah okay go ahead Yeah. all right um i just had a thought and around the time you were talking about bakhtin and all of that yes so you know how do we see history in light of what bakhtin has used like the term dialogic so can, do we consider history dialogic by nature or do we have to endeavor to make it dialogic yeah so uh, thank you so much so uh, in a way i'm uh, i've been talking about that uh, you know from different angles uh, uh if history were already dialogic then it would already have to be uh somehow situated within the sphere of discourse because in bakhtin this kind of dialogism is part of a kind of discursivity popular discursivity sometimes it can be called cultural discursivity you know it can take place to festivals to a certain kind of tradition of fiction uh, carnival what he calls carnivalesque uh, creations and so on and so forth at uh, the level of community but if all objects artifacts spaces of collective participation so history is can be seen like that as a kind of collective participation through the festival of time if one may put it like that then yes then yes history is intrinsically and can be intrinsically dialogical but you see i try i try to bring out this point that history also has the other has the other side which is the problematical side something which is trauma which is un unreconciled something which has not been symbolized or brought into discourse uh so for instance uh, and one of the examples of this different the example from uh, jean françois lyotard's concept is of course the 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 the, the holocaust the show up in the history of um, in the history of um antisemitism 
so, uh, so is it possible to really speak of something like the genocide uh, of any community? Of course, the, 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 the genocide of the Jews is a specific example for any community by saying that, okay, now uh, we'll, we'll, we will talk about the, the worst by bringing it everyone concerned, but that's a contradiction in terms. If you bring, if you are able to bring everyone on board, then how did the worst ever happen? You know, so this becomes an unreconciled, problematical real, and yet it is unavoidably real. Now, this does not mean that we leave it there, but the point is that we then search in a completely new way for a new. Um, a new historical, so that's the second part of your question, that then history becomes a kind of, a kind of well, a, a kind of task, a kind of intervention, a kind of almost, a kind of experiment, uh, what I started out by saying, a kind of gamble, a wager, an act of courage, that let's try and go into history to find something there to bring it into dialogue or into a dialogical space. In itself, it is not necessary that it gives itself dialogically. In only specific uh, experiences of this kind of the problematical real. Otherwise, I mean, in much of history, there is so much possibility of this kind of dialogism that actually it is it is it is uh, such uh, such a loss that we often let go of the pleasure of the dialogism and uh, indulge in so much uh, you know self congratulatory and monotonous. Uh, um, representation of history as something so unilinear and mono, monological. So, yeah. Okay, and uh, Reshmi Thank has you. a question too, sir. Sure, sure. Uh, Reshmi's question is, historians study uh, history of history or as present in historical time? Can you repeat that, please? Uh, she asks uh, whether historians study history of history or they study it as uh, present in historical time. Right, right. No, so that's very, very, very interesting. So, yes, absolutely. So all historiography, all hi history as writing about the past is all, always a study of that very writing, you know, that very act of writing. So, in a way, this is the question which we, we have to again and again contend with, that who is the subject of history? Is it that historians write about a subject of history or is it that historians are themselves, in a sense, actors of history or they're kind of, they wear the mask of the subject of history? Uh, now, this pertains to the question of the attitude of the historian, uh, which is it closer to that of a scientist or is it closer to that of a, a performer of some sorts, you know, who puts on several masks? Uh, a certain kind of materialist, scientific, even Marxist history, which has really done so much pioneering work, um, did not at all subscribe to the view that the historian can be mixed up, can be confused with the subject of history. And in a way, the subject of history must always uh, be kept at a distance from the historian. Now it is it is a, a complete change of uh, a situation when people who today have so much um, almost hatred against Marxist history um, and Marxist historians in India uh, really basically end up saying that oh these historians actually they were the only they made themselves the subjects of history so all of history is distorted because uh, these historians instead of going to the real subjects of history made themselves the subjects of history. You know, there's a total, total reversal of the, of this, of this. Whereas the scientific uh, ethos or the attitude of the, of the that kind of materialist historian was precisely to keep a distance from the subject of history. But it is with the other kind of history writing uh, that this question becomes much more accessible. That if history is also the writing about uh, the historian's tools, the historian's protocols, the historian's situation, you know, discuss a situation, uh, then uh, history will always be a writing about the present 
not in the sense of the present as simply continuing from the past, the present in the sense that at what point at a certain present, a particular past becomes a question or a problem. So this is something which Michel Foucault, the, um, the, the totally heterodox historian, used to, used to ask, or he used to pose, that why do I write something like a history? Because as so it is something philosophical. I write something as a history because, for instance, he wrote about sexuality, uh, history of sexuality, history of madness. He said, because madness, sexuality, these are not self-evident natural categories. They are problems, or they become problems at a particular conjunction. And I write their histories so as to free myself from these problems. So I'm compelled, what, what am I compelled to think about? Something which is a problem. You know? so I, this is a different kind of meaning of thinking than the thinking of principle. That I can talk about again separately. But there is a kind of historical thinking. Foucault said, why do I have to think of madness? Because today madness is not madness. It has become the object of mental illness or men, uh, object of psychiatry and it's called mental illness. Now, it has become a new object of thinking, historical thinking. And because it's become a new object of thinking, it is a new problem. So now history must be able to, in a sense, tell me why I'm forced to think of madness in a new way, as mental illness, as a psychiatric problem. If I'm able to do that, then in a way history opens up a possible future when madness is neither the old madness nor mental illness, but some third way. In that sense, the historian is someone who performs both a genealogy, but also occupies the present, where the present is also broken off a little bit from the past. So this yes, is that something means. which to me is a very important um, sort of a, both a meeting point and a point of separation yeah. on the question of history and discourse. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, I would just like to add yeah. Uh, sure. Another concern yeah. when you have already brought in Foucault, and mm -hmm. so so while I'm going back in the historical time and questioning the adversity of the society or you know the the diversion uh, in that sense, for example, we are trying to discuss madness. The very question that. I see something problematic in the historical time or, or back in the time. We can call it history, we can call it experience, or we can call it a narrative which has come to us in the form of a story. Um, am I beginning from the position of certain principles already? Those are axiomatic. The very fact that you know Foucault never went to the field and so he always probably began from either personal experience or axiomatic principles. Should we, I mean, can we take, have the, I mean, can we be audacious about it or humble about it if we really want to take this question up? Yeah, that's a, uh, that's, that's, that's a very subtle question and kind of on the edge between audacious and humility. Um, well, you know, just to, to, to go back to Foucault's own, uh, own case, uh, you're right, uh, much from his personal experience and, uh, and endless, endless uh, exploration of documents, but not, so to speak, field. Uh, but you see, that's the thing. The moment you sp speak of field, there the question of experience is already identified. For Foucault, the problem was precisely that something like an identity of an experience, so the identification or representability of an experience is has broken down to an extent. That's why I have to write a history. But for him, the question of experience is real, but it's also, you know, philosophically, it's, a, it's also a problem which can be put in terms of representation, that conditions of the possibility of representing experience do not exist uh, anymore or not sufficiently. Don't exist anymore. Uh, while experience is something which is absolute, undeniable, 
uh, and it is concrete. And yet it is also problematical. Uh, so that's why um, what we have to go by is uh, a kind of, uh, yes, you're right, a kind of uh, uh, audaciousness, a kind of, yes, a leap you have to make um, about, about a certain genealogy that it, it possesses the depths of time. Uh, but with regard to documents, because you see, just because there is no unified representation anymore or there's a crisis of that sort of unity of representation does not mean that there are no representations. On the contrary, there's too much representation. Madness is too much representation. There's too many documents. So the thing is, with regard to documents, with regard to reading, with regard to, there has to be absolute humility. You know? But this is the very interesting that you ask it like that. With Foucault, it seems to me, or someone like Foucault, and as a historian, it is at the level of something like writing that you find in, in the initial phase with Foucault, this changes later. With his Madness book, what you'll find is in the, in the writing, there is an audaciousness. There is a kind of extravagance. Why? In the sheer archival sort of uh, arranging and rearranging of documents, there is endless modesty. <laughs> this bit with his sexuality book at the end actually dovetails into a balance of modesties on both sides, humility on both sides. Even with documentation, he keeps to that kind of a endless exploration and never enough. Read everything and yet never as a specialist because he, no one can be a specialist in such a, a wide genre, a variety of genres. And at the same time, make writing into something almost an act of austerity, uh, self, mm -hmm. uh, self. This you find in which is very interesting, you know, the way mm. you ask it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I'm sure we have more questions, but unfortunately we have run out of time. Thank you so much for your articulate and cogent presentation. I am sure everybody benefited from it uh, as much as I did. And uh, to the participants, happy Republic Day in advance, uh, to everybody, in fact, but uh, it's just to let the participants know that we don't have a session tomorrow, and uh, we'll meet soon next week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention.